trust that you are all doing well. Looking forward to a good week and uh, a beginning of some more ministries here at our church once again. Mike will flip through the thing if you've got your bulletin with you. Uh, many of you know that several of us have been uh, ministering over at the Beyond Blessed Food Pantry every week. And it truly is a blessing to be a blessing over there. And there are needs and there are opportunities for anybody to serve. If you'd like to do that, please give me a call. It's hard sometimes for them to connect new volunteers because, number one, they have so many people wanting to volunteer. And number two, they're just so busy trying to coordinate everything that's going on because as they grow and more people become aware of them, then there's more people trying to donate and that just takes up more of their time. So sometimes some things get a little dropped. So. If you would like to serve in some way, please let me know and I'll do my best to make sure you get connected to the right people. Starting next Sunday at 6 o'clock, we're going to try something a little bit different. Uh, I'm going to try a Sunday night evening uh, prayer and uh, Bible study, small group study, I guess you could say, will be right here in the sanctuary. And Lindsay's going to lead us through an apologetics study. And if you're not sure what I mean by that, it just means about how to know what we know about our faith and how to share that confidently with others. Sometimes we are asked by people, uh, what, why do you believe that the Bible is true? How do you answer that? Well, this is part of what we're going to be talking about here in a couple of Sunday nights, uh, oh, throughout the summer, and a lot of other questions like that. Tough questions that you have been asked, or might be asked, as you share your faith and live for Christ. And Lindsay's going to lead us through some things that she has learned and has taught our teenagers as well in Sunday school. And so looking forward to that, it's going to be a great opportunity. And it will be recorded if you happen to not be able to make it or are concerned about being in public too much or whatever. Um, it will be there. So we'll get those up on the website as soon as we can afterwards. Also, Backyard Bible Club is coming back to North Freedom Baptist. When we meet back there behind the parsonage underneath that uh, maple tree. And CEF is going to come and bring their teen and college missionaries to share the gospel and Bible stories and songs and some games with neighborhood kids. So we need to get busy inviting neighborhood kids, and we need a couple of volunteers, and we need pre-packaged store-bought snacks, food and or drinks. And if it's going to be really hot, we need some drinks. We'll at least have water. But a few would like to help provide those. I mean, the ladies group in the past has helped with that, and other ladies and uh, families have helped provide. And so looking forward to that opportunity with kids coming up here in just a couple of weeks. So if you know any kids in North Freedom, Make sure that they know about this. I've got some flyers in the office. And if you have any hand those out, they'll be put out around town starting this week. So that's it for announcements. Make sure you take a look at the birthdays and anniversaries coming up this month as well. And make sure you wish everyone a happy anniversary. Well, let's begin our time of praise and worship together. Let me read from Psalm 40, verses 1 through 4, to whet our appetites for worship today and remind us but who it is that we are worshiping and why. From Psalm 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see in fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. We are here to worship our Heavenly Father, the Creator and Maker of all the earth, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in the power of the Spirit as He leads and guides us today. Let us pray and begin our time in worship today. Father, this morning we have come together to bring honor and glory to your name. We are the ones who have waited patiently for you. You have turned to us. You have heard our cries for salvation, for rescue, and for refuge. You have met our needs on a daily basis. And Father, we thank you. We give you praise and glory. We lift up your name today because you deserve it above all. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to come and to die on a cross for our sins, to pay the penalty for our sins, to be raised to new life, that we might have new life in him. We look forward to that day when we can worship together all believers before your throne, that we can live with you forever throughout eternity. Father, we thank you, we praise you, we long and look forward for that day. In the meantime, we pray that you would help us to worship now, to prepare, to practice for the great day when we worship with all the saints in the Lord. We thank you, Father, once again, for providing for our needs. We thank you for the opportunity 
to give back to you, to the ministries of this church, to continue to see uh, your kingdom expanding. We pray that your will will be done here throughout this church, through our ministries, opportunities to serve, day by day, week by week. Father, we pray for fellow churches in our community. We pray that uh, day to day, but also uh, be worshiping you for who you are and for what you've done. Worshiping the Spirit and in truth. We pray that you would guide us all into your word, led by your Spirit, to be who you call us to be. Father, we pray for those around the world who are worshiping today, especially we think of those who are worshiping in secret or uh, in fear because of uh, persecution. We pray that you would strengthen them, continue to lead them and guide them to know your word and to continue to spread the gospel despite uh, the consequences that might come upon them. Father, we pray that your word and your kingdom would continue to expand throughout the world. We pray for peace, we pray for reconciliation, we pray for comfort, we pray for safety, we pray for those who are not here with us this morning for whatever reason. We pray that you would guide and direct and bless them and help them to know that we miss them, we care for them, and that uh, we long to see them again very soon as well. Father, we pray now that you would guide and direct our hearts to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand and I don't think I put it on the screen, but let's recite the Lord's Prayer this morning. I think we can do that without some help today. And then Andy and the team will give us an amazing news. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
that once again this morning. Guiding us in the song and praise and worship for Sunday. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. Our Gospel Scripture reading this morning. Reading John chapter 5, verses 16 through 30. John 5, verse 16. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the son can do nothing by himself. He can, only, he can do only what he sees his father do. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. I tell you the truth, the time is coming and has now come, and the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. The words of Jesus. But his role, life in him, he is doing the Father's will will continue to do the Father's will. He has life in himself and he gives life to all who will believe in him and will raise them all at the last day. We look forward to that day. We are thankful for what he has done for us that we might believe in him and have eternal life through his death on the cross. Let us sing once again of his sacrifice for us in number 190. Are you washed in the blood? So we praise our Lord and Savior for what he has done for us. Verses 1 and 2.
has done for us, especially for his work upon Calvary. And his work as we learned last week, uh, being our advocate, our high priest before the Father, even at this very moment. Resting at his Father's side, but yet ruling and reigning over all things. Thankful for that. Uh, before we turn to uh, the book of 1 John for our message this morning, I do want to just relate a couple of prayer requests to you. Uh, Bill Brooks is home from the hospital. He's been in the hospital for at least 10 days, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but he was there and had some heart complications. And, but he is home now, resting and doing well today. So thanking the Lord for that. Jewel has asked for prayer for her brother Jack. Um, we prayed for him off and on for the past couple of years, but he's had some health complications recently. And he's asked for prayer and she's asked for prayer for him as well. So keep them in your prayers. They would greatly appreciate that. So others, Dutch and Donna, Dell and Gay, of course, Pearl, um, kind of stuck at home because of the virus and also because of just their health. They were all stuck at home for the most part anyway. But uh, keep them in your prayers and your prayer needs with them. They would love and appreciate a phone call or a card as well if you have to keep that throughout the week. So let me have a word of prayer before we head into the word. Father, this morning we thank you for the opportunity we have to come to you and to feed upon your word. Your son has given us his body, has given us the blood that washes us, cleanses us, gives us eternal life through your grace and mercy towards us in him. Father, today we want to feast upon your word and pray that you would impart it to our lives, that it would nourish us, that it would encourage us, that it would remind us of great and mighty truths lead us to live great and mighty lives for you and for your son, to be bold for your kingdom. Father, this morning as we go into your word, we are also mindful and uh, thinking of loved ones in our church. We think of uh, Bill this morning, and we know we don't get to see him very often due to his health, but we are thankful that he is home now and resting, and uh, that his uh, heart is doing much better, and we pray that you just continue to watch over him. We pray for Jack, Jewel's brother, and we pray that you would be with his uh, health concerns. For others on our prayer list who have mentioned health concerns as well, Father, we pray that your will would be done, that you would bring appointments uh, closer if possible, but in the meantime that you would provide strength and health until those appointments are able to happen. We pray for those who are seeking and receiving treatments for uh, cancer and uh, other ailments, Father, we pray that your will would be done there as well. For those who are working, Father, today could not be with us, we pray that you strengthen them and bless them, help them, and others who have to work every Sunday because they are watching over us, protecting us, guiding, keeping people safe. We pray that you would just impart them with your grace and your knowledge and your mercy today. Father, once again, we pray that your will would be done, that your kingdom would be expanded throughout the ministry of this church and other enemy churches in our country and around the world. We pray that you would provide for our missionaries, bless them, strengthen them, and comfort them. We pray. Guide us now once again into your word. Guide my words that I might share your truth uh, in the way that you would like it to be shared in the way that we need to hear it from today. That we might live for you, confident in who we are as your children. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 John. We're going to be moving through the book of 1 John for our service today message today, I should say. First and second Peter, first and second John. Here we go, first John. I'm not going to be able to read all of the verses that are on uh, your notes or that are on the screen today, but I will read the ones specifically for our time together this morning. I'm sorry? What's on the, the notes or the bulletin is also up on the screen for you this morning as well. Blessed assurance part two, evidence of saving grace. Believers can look for the present and continuous work of the Holy Spirit in their lives as evidence that they belong to Christ. We all at 
at times want to have that reassurance that, yes, I'm a believer, I'm a child of God, I'm going to heaven, I'm going to be with Christ forever, and no matter what may come between now and then, I'm confident in my faith that I am a child of God. Last week we began to look at this truth, what the Bible teaches about eternal security and assurance of faith, looking at the role of the Trinity in our salvation and sanctification, and we're reminded that our salvation is secure because God brings about our salvation from beginning to end. We have the choice to receive it, to believe it, or to reject it. For those who have received it, who have believed it, claim Jesus as their Lord and Savior, we are eternally secure in Him because God does not lose. He does not go back on His word. If He has said it is so, it is so, and we can rest confidently in that. But yet there are times when we struggle. We doubt whether or not we truly belong to Christ. Most of the time this struggle comes because we feel like we are lost. Perhaps we were in church when we were young. And we had questions. We didn't really doubt, but we just, not everything made sense. And so we would ask really tough questions. And not everybody always really knew how to answer those tough questions. And so maybe the way that they came across to us made us think like, well, those questions are I don't matter. I've had those tough questions. And then we begin to wonder, well, if they can't answer my tough questions, then what about all the other stuff that they teach me? How can I know if that's true? And if they're just, you know, trying to make me feel better about this. A lot of people believe that. In fact, recently, a, a singer in a Christian band, a Christian rock band, uh, denied his faith for that very reason. We often feel unconfident. We feel like I don't know for sure. Maybe it's because we're living a life of sin. We're not walking with the Lord the way that we should be. And so that fellowship is not there. And then we begin to wonder because things happen in our lives because God's trying to get our attention and we just wonder what's really going on. And instead of doing what we're doing today, we turn to our feelings and we allow our feelings to guide us often away from the truth. Instead of turning to the truth, seeing the evidence, the basic principles for saving grace. Jonathan Edwards, famous preacher of years gone by, said that the principal evidence of saving grace is holy living. That's a big general characterization, of course, but that is so true. If our lives are characterized by holy living, then we can rest assured we belong to Christ. So this morning I want to take a quick dive in the deep end. It's going to be quick fast, way too fast. I apologize for that. But you can take these verses and uh, what's shared with you today and uh, study them on your own and we can get together and study them. If you have more questions, we'd be more than happy to do that with you. But if we are truly believers in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, there will be a present and continuing work of the Spirit in our lives which produces evidence of saving faith. So we're going to look at nine of these this morning. There are others that we can look at. Don't take the number nine and be like, we're going to be here all day. Uh, we won't, I promise. But nine evidences of saving faith in our lives. First of all, this morning, fellowship with the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. 1 John 1, 1 through 3. Here we see the Apostle John writing to a church. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. And this is, verse 3 is where we really want to focus on in this brief moment. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. John and the other apostles were with Christ. They witnessed everything that they wrote about in the Gospels. And so they taught that to others. And that teaching was meant to bring people to Christ. So that they could have a relationship, a fellowship with the Heavenly Father through the Son and the Spirit. What does this word fellowship mean? We throw this word around a lot in our church and in a lot of churches. And a lot of times we just mean chit-chatting about the Packers or the weather or something like that. And that is barely on the register of what it means to have fellowship. Fellowship means to have an ongoing, continuous relationship 
a participation with one another in each other's lives. It's a joining, it's a union, it's, it is the social aspect of being united together in the body of Christ. But it's also a participation in our common cause of shared life in spreading the gospel and living out the gospel. In our relationship with God, it means spending time with God. There is no more important relationship than the relationship we can have with our Heavenly Father. That only happens because we have confessed our sin, repented of our sin, claimed the blood of Christ as forgiving our sin, washing away our sin, trusting in His resurrection and giving us a new life. So that brings us together. Reconciliation, peace between us sinners who used to hate God and who now love God because of what He's done for us in Christ. And we are now in a tight relationship with Him. Fellowship with God happens through time with the written Word and the living Word of God. Prayer, Bible study, meditation, biblical meditation, contemplating, what does this verse mean? What do these words mean? What is this truth in the Bible? Where can I find it? Study, practicing spiritual disciplines, appropriately as we've taught here in the past. But daily time if God is the most important being in the universe, the only one who can save us from our sins through the giving of His Son, He is the one who should get primary priority time in our life. That's what it means to have fellowship with God, making Him the focus of all of our relationships. He gets the most time, the most effort from us, because we want to be with Him. Because salvation has produced a new life in which we are now in a true and open relationship with God. Yes, He already knows everything about us, but that's not the point. The point is we have fellowship with Him, and we commune with Him. We learn from Him more about who He is, more about who we are, and who He wants us to be. Fellowship with God. We could spend, we need to spend so much more time on this, but this is key and critical to having a confident faith confidence that we belong to Christ. If that fellowship, that desire is there, they are making that time, that effort to be with God. We can't say that we're Christians if we never spend any time with God. It just doesn't work. It doesn't work. That time with God, fellowship with God, will also lead us to being honest about our sin, which is the next point that John gets to in chapter 1 here, in verses 5 through 10. Here he talks about, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' his Son purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. We claim to have fellowship with God. If we claim to be believers, and that also means that we are honest about our sin. We can't walk in the light, live in the light, live in the truth, God's truth, God's way, and yet sin at the same time. Or claim that we're not sinning. We are. We are all redeemed sinners. That is what we are. We are forgiven. We are people that are sinners who are on our way to heaven because of what God has done for us in Christ. But we still struggle with sin. We're going to get to more of that in just a few moments. But we have got to be honest about that fact before God and before others. Because if we walk in the light, God is going to point out, this is something we need to work on. There's this area of your life. This is not holy. This is not pure. This is not righteous. Let's work on this. That's part of the fellowship, learning to be honest about our sin and believing. God says about it, and working with God about it in God's way. We are not honest about the fact that we are sinners saved by grace, that we still struggle with sin, that we might have a problem. We might not be the believers we claim that we are. Those who belong to God through faith in Christ are ready to acknowledge their daily need for forgiveness, because we're in a process of becoming what God has already so more fellowship with God will equal more dislike, more hatred, more turning away from sin in our life, but also in the world around 
hates. God absolutely hates sin. There's no other way to put it. I mean, I don't know what else to say at the moment about it. He absolutely abhors sin. It keeps all of us away from Him. It puts a dividing wall between us. It makes us dead to Him until we trust in Christ. Of course He would be. It's everything against who He is and what He declares to be true. So as we come to know God more, our, our relationship with God grows, and we come to have an appropriate relationship with sin, which is destroy it in my life and speak against it in the world around us and in the church. When we sin, we confess it, we repent of it, we seek forgiveness, we are restored to fellowship. We have a greater fellowship with God. For Christ is just and is faithful and he will forgive us according to what he has done. Fellowship with God, fellowship with the Son, fellowship with the Spirit leads to honest, being honest about our sin, evidences of saving faith, also leads to obedient living. Verses two, or excuse me, 3, 4, and 5, and 6 of chapter 2. That we know, we, yeah, we know that we have come to know Him if we obey His commandments. The man who says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. If anyone obeys His word, God's love is truly made complete in Him. This is how we know we are in Him. You want to know if you're truly in the faith, you truly belong to Christ, whoever claims to live in Him, to believe in Him, must walk as Jesus said. Fellowship with God, being honest about our sin, living obediently is an evidence of faith. Now, of course, we're going to mess it up. We just talked about that. We're going to mess it up. We're not always going to get it right. But is there a desire? Is there evidence of more and more obedient living in our lives? True believers are actively striving to live as Jesus, holy and righteous based upon His Word. Not to receive our salvation, but because we have been saved. We do belong to Christ, and we are following Him in all areas of life. To become a believer is to become a slave of Christ. It's to become a student, to learn to live and to serve Him the way He wants us to. He is our Savior. He is our God. He is our Lord. And we long and strive to honor Him and to live the way He has lived. Living a life of obedience. Fourthly, that leads to we have a, a, a love for God and beginning to hate our sin, we're turning to striving to live obediently, to live holy and righteous lives. That means that we're going to have no love for the world. And when I say love, there in point number four, I mean an affection, a desire to be a part of the in it. 1 John 2, 15, 16, and 17. John says, do not love the world. Don't have an affection. Don't set your eyes, your heart upon the world or anything in the world. And he's not meaning the physical planet. We know that. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, all those things that the flesh lusts after, that wants, desires, power, and prestige, popularity, and me first. The lust of his eyes, wanting everything I can see, who I can see. The boasting of what he has and does. Look at what I have accomplished. Look at what I can do, what I will do. All of that comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Believers are not to love the system of the world the system of evil, the system that Satan is currently reigning over, the system that Satan brought into this world in his attack against God. The way of life governed by Satan, the way of life that we were redeemed from, by the way. We used to be, according to Paul in many of his letters, we used to be the sinners, the, the, the adulterers, the thieves, the murderers, and all these other sins that he talks about. But then we came to Christ, and that has ended, and our love for that is gone. Of course, the sinful nature is still there, and it's at war within us trying to drag us down so that we are not having the same testimony that God wants us to have. There's a battle, definitely. But where is our hunger? Where is our thirst? What is our passion? What is our drive? Is it for the world, or is it for the hunger and thirst of righteousness and purity and heart? For obedient living. Seeking after 
these things are evident in our life. Increasingly, more and more, day by day, week by week, year by year. Evidence of true and saving faith. No love for the world. Fifthly, we come to a lack of habitual, continual sin in our lives. And yeah, I'm probably doubling up there on my adjectives, but I do that on purpose. 1 John chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. No one who is born of God will continue to sin, because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. We're going to get to that, that part of the verse in just a few moments. In Romans chapter 6, verses 14 and 17, the Apostle Paul touches on this as well. He says, Sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching in which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. We've already talked about the fact that Christians do still sin. That's why you have the first part of uh, their chapter, uh, chapter 1, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. If we still sin, we must confess and repent and see. This is talking about unconfessed, unrepentant, shamelessly living in this sin, even though I claim to be a Christian. I'm going to continue to be a thief. I don't care. I'm under grace. It doesn't matter. That's the kind of attitude that's being talked about. Many in our culture today are trying to promote this. I can still live a lifestyle apart from what God has said is good and righteous and still be saved and still be a Christian. God's word would say absolutely not. If we're honest about our struggle, we're confessing that, repenting of that, Agreeing with God that it is sin, and we're struggling and fighting against that, and that's evidence of saving faith. And to shamelessly say that I'm just going to keep living the way I want to live, and I'm saved, and that's all that, that matters. That's not an attitude of salvation, being saved by grace. That's an attitude of self-righteousness. Shameless, unrepentant practice of sin is not what believers are. Believers are controlled by the Spirit and willing to submit to the Lord as their master and strive for so when he says, this is wrong in your life, we need to deal with this, we are willing to let him deal with it. Believers have a lack of habitual, continual sin. Yes, there are struggles. Yes, there are some sins that we commit that become physical uh, addictions that need to be overcome. But it's got to start as well at the spiritual level, because... All of those addictions are essentially idolatries. We're trying to fill the need that God was meant to meet with something else, another substance, another person, a belief, a way of life. All of those sins are idolatries. They need to be dealt with spiritually and physically as well if they happen to affect the physical, biological body. That can be very difficult and that can take a lifetime. And we need to be loving and gracious towards those who are fighting and struggling those types of things, helping them as much as we can. I'm going to move quickly here for the next few, because these are ones that we talk about quite often. But number six, evidence of saving grace is a hope to see Christ. From 1 John 3, 2 and 3. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, said in uh, 2 Timothy 4, 8, There is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have long before his appearing. Do we desire to be like Christ? Do we desire to see Christ? If that desire is in you and it's growing daily, day, and it's a part of what helps you to seek to kill sin in your life and live obediently, and it's evidence of saving faith, because that's what God wants for His children. A longing and desire to be with Him, not only now, but throughout eternity. To see Christ, to be like Him, now and in the future. I pray and hope and trust that your desire to see Christ, to be like Him, to be with Him, is growing, moment by moment. Seventh, 
a love for fellow believers, another evidence of saving faith. 1 John 2, 9 and 10. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. There is nothing in him to make him stumble. 1 John 3, 10. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. Catching a theme here, 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death into the life of sin, the life of the world, because we love our brothers, we're not in that. And evidence of not being part of Satan's world is by a love for our brothers. Who are the brothers? They are those who trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior. Our fellow church members, our fellow believers. Love for them. I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Uh, did that last year. If you need to, uh, some reminder about that, you can find those online through YouTube or the website. But believers are totally committed to and willing to sacrifice for other believers. We're willing to be there, to stand in the gap, to pray, to help meet needs, spiritually and physically. It's part of our benevolence. It's part of a variety of other ways in which we strive to love each other. But one aspect I think that many American Christians struggle with is love for each other. is letting ourselves be loved by each other. We don't want to admit that I need help, that I'm struggling. Especially here in, in America, we like, you know, I can do this my own. I can, I'll just get a third job and I just won't sleep. I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know? That type of an attitude when if we could just reach out to the church and let the church, God's people, love us and help us. Not to take over for us or to keep us from being responsible. That's not what I'm talking about. But to help us to get to a place where we can as God wants us to. There's no such thing as a truly independent believer. I take care of myself. If we can't take care of our sin, why would we think that we can live this life without the help of God and Christ, the Spirit of the Word, and our fellow believers? We need to turn to each other. It means we need to be trustworthy people, respectful and honest and honorable, full of integrity. So that when someone comes to us and says, I'm struggling in this area, can you help me? We can love them, and they know that we will love them. Let us be people who love and allow ourselves to be loved by one another. Number eight, evidence of saving grace is prayers are answered. 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, if we have confidence before God, we believe in Christ, we know that we are His children, and receive from Him anything we ask, because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. We have fellowship with God. We can approach His throne of grace confidently, boldly. We can be the little kid who just bursts into the room and says, I need help, help me. Or thank you or praise you because of something awesome. If we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of Him. Prayers that are answered are prayers that God prays Himself. That God wants us to pray. True believers want what God wants. And we pray for God's will to be done. We see those prayers answered. Maybe not immediately. Maybe not even in our lifetime. But that doesn't mean that prayers are not answered. God's will will be done. And he longs for us to pray accordingly. That's how Jesus taught us. Thy will be done. I am. John has been talking in this chapter of 1 John 5 about living victoriously for Christ. And that's a prayer that God wants to answer. He wants to make that evident and possible in your life. But we need to pray for it. We need to seek it. We need to desire it. It's a prayer answered by God, for it's what God wants to allow us to grow in the knowledge and grace of our Lord and Savior that we might be like Him. It's answered prayer in a variety of ways, but answered prayer according to God's will. Evidence of saving faith. As you pray, as you've prayed throughout the past few months, days, and weeks, years, have you seen the answers to your Evidence that we trust Finally, number nine, probably one of the greatest evidences of saving faith, being hated 
by works. 1 John 3, 13. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. It's the same world he talks about earlier when he says, do not love the world or the things of the world. Paul reflects this as well in Philippians 1, 29. He says, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, meaning persecution. Believers will suffer for living victoriously holy lives, striving to live victorious and holy lives. The world hates God, and therefore the world hates believers. They couldn't kill Jesus. He came back from the dead, and now he's ascended and reigning on high victoriously, so they can't get to God directly, so they'll get to those who claim to know him and love him. John 15, 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first belongs to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of you. That is why the world hates you. There is a problem if we are loved by the world. I'm not saying that John, Jesus here, is not saying that they might like you because you're a nice person, these things, but as soon as your godly life starts to rub against their ungodly life, there's a change in heart and attitude and focus on the relationship. Many of you understand what I'm talking about. If we are loved by the world, there's a problem. If we are striving to be loved by the world, there's a problem. If our professed faith doesn't bring on some sort of pushback from the world, then our faith is suspect. Persecution is one of the most, if not the most, surest and most tangible evidence of true saving faith. And I'm not talking about just severe life-threatening persecution like what we hear about in China and North Korea and some Muslim countries. Although that does happen, it has happened even here in the States, unfortunately. Persecution can come at any time and in a variety of ways, soft or very, very difficult. Holding a belief in many of the topics we're going to talk about this summer. Holding to traditional biblical marriage is enough to get you persecuted in this country today. In this world today. Even holding to creation, God created, is enough to lose a degree. To not be able to get a degree in some college universities in our nation today. You could lose a promotion, you could lose a job, you could lose or be denied a degree. I just mentioned, you could lose fan, friends or family. They might turn against you, never want to be a part of your life again. Could even be a loss of a home, possibly jail time, or even loss of life. And I'm not necessarily talking about sometimes we Christians get a little obnoxious. If we do things that maybe we shouldn't do, and we might get ourselves arrested, I'm not entirely sure that's necessarily persecution. You've got to be wise and discerning. But as we're going to talk about, begin talking about next week, there is a place for us to begin standing up and saying, this is wrong and this is why. And when that happens, we're going to get pushed back. And it could come in a variety of ways. If we truly are believers in Christ, there will be a present and continuing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I mentioned nine things here this morning. What have you noticed that you're like, oh yeah, yeah that's, I see that in my life. That needs to grow in my life. Pay attention to these things. Take these things home. Look them over. Pray about them. Ask God to show you. Where am I truly in the faith? And if I am, where am I back? Where do I need to grow? Help me to grow. Lord Jesus. Believers, trust the truth of Scripture more than your feelings. There will be times of doubt. There will be times of lack of confidence. There will be times when we wonder, trust the scriptures, trust the promises, trust the principles. Okay? Pray, seek for signs. Yes, Lord, show me that I belong to you by based on these things we've talked about this morning. Believers can be confident our salvation is secure and our faith is real if we and others see evidence of faith in our lives. If you see evidence of faith in somebody else's life, Encourage them in that. Remind them of that. Let them know, hey, that's awesome. I see you growing in, in the Word. I see you praying more often. I see this in you. 
Let them know that because that's an encouragement. Oh, thank you. Somebody else sees it as well. It's not just me because our hearts and minds, we can be deceitful. We can often think of ourselves better than we really are. Sometimes we can think of ourselves as worse than we really are too. We need that encouragement from one another. If believers can trust that we're not seeing evidence and we can turn to Christ. We can repent, seek forgiveness, and find His reassuring mercy and grace. He will forgive us to the truth. He will reassure us of our faith. His love for us. Father, this morning we looked at some basic, some brief truths of the scripture. We thank you for these principles that are written down for us that we might go back to them again and again for ourselves and for others to be reminded of what you have worked in our lives through your spirit, through your son. During times of doubt, Father, I pray that those gathered here this morning, those who are part of our church family, would be encouraged in their faith, that they would know for sure beyond a doubt that they belong to Christ. If there is doubt, Father, then help us to seek you and to seek forgiveness, to seek the truth, the promises, the principles of your word, that we might have confidence, and that we might then stand up and boldly go and share the truth of the gospel. That we might live holy lives, that we might hate the sin in our lives, and the sin around us, that we would stand up against it appropriately as you have taught us in your word. Father, may we be lights to one another and to this dark world. That you save and transform lives. You make us alive again in your sight. That we might have hope in the future. We thank you for that and we praise you. We pray that you help us to long to be with and see Christ. That together we will continue to worship him until that day we're all gathered together with all the saints before your throne. Praise and glory for who you are. We thank you for your love for us in Jesus. It's in his name. Let's turn now to him, number 372, Living for Jesus. Just the first word, first verse this morning. It's a reminder and encouragement for us to continue standing with the faith of the Living for Jesus, the life of the